uh, had the innate self might be copied. Because the copying process tells you something about the use of this information content contained within DNA. Not so much to make the components of the cell other than, of course, the components required for information being carried from one generation to the next. DNA replication, the copying of DNA. In the slide, you can see the double-stranded DNA, of course, is copied. And we all know that, of course, because otherwise there'd be no DNA sitting in subsequent generations of subsequent cells. But that DNA copying process requires the peeling apart of a strand. And it's obvious by the sheer length of these strands that must occur sequentially. And you can see over here in this image that in the top, working its way down, we have untouched DNA, the parent strands of DNA, much as you saw for the classical Watson and Crick structure. But across the base now, peeled apart, almost like we can imagine a fig leaf has been removed from the central location here, we can see how the strands now, the correspondence the parental strands, have constructed upon them newly synthesized DNA. And again, the information content contained within that DNA helps to describe the way in which assembly takes place. So opposite A is the T's, opposite G is the C's. And you can see a series of those being brought in as individual components across the centre, just below where the strands are being pulled apart. And those are deoxynucleoside triphosphates or deoxynucleotides. And they consist, for example, of deoxyguanosine triphosphate. And, of course, the other components that correspond to A, C and T. And they're sitting around, they're being brought in on a gradual basis for assembly. And again, you can see this wonderful construction of, of double-stranded DNA, the bottom left leg and the bottom right leg over here. Now, those complementary new strands, by complementary mean base paired, uh, following rules of A's and T's, G's and C's, of course, does not occur spontaneously. And while one could have a look just at the content of DNA and might indeed predict that it's a very simple system, Indeed, it's a very elegant system, but it's far from simple. And although we don't have a lot of time to go through it today, you can see here now that DNA replication, like most cellular processes, requires assistance. And that assistance, of course, can be on the RNA, can be protein, amongst others. But let's just contemplate the consequences of some RNA components, but particularly the protein-based components. You can see now that that same double-stranded structure replicating has been turned on a side. And now the parental strand, parental DNA, double-stranded, is shown the right-hand side. The peeling apart strands are shown on the left-hand side here, above and below. But now we can see a series of key features. And this, again, is, is, is a much clearer description of the story. For one thing now, we've labelled the strands, five prime ends, three prime ends. And you can start to see that what is occurring is essentially consequence of the enzyme, in this case the major enzyme revol uh, uh, involved in copying DNA. In a bacterial system, in this case the wonderfully characterized system of E. coli, Escherichia coli, uh, result of superb work by many researchers and particularly contributions of Arthur Kornberg, what we can see now is that the DNA polymerase 3 and the complete enzyme form now is able to move in one defined direction. It moves by extending the, the newly synthesized daughter strand here down towards the same direction where the strands of double strand DNA are being pulled apart from the parental DNA. So the movement in this case is from left to right, five prime to three prime with respect to the newly synthesized strand. And wonderfully, DNA polymerase 3 is not the only enzyme involved in DNA synthesis um, which constructs DNA which needs to move in this way. It turns out that every DNA polymerase described to date, and indeed RNA polymerases, and the enzymes involved in RNA synthesis all move in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction with respect to the newly synthesized material. So you can see that's easy to construct as long as you are synthesizing DNA in the same direction as strands are being pulled apart. So that's why this is called the leading strand. It's a leading or it's a continuous strand where there's just this constant flow, this movement of DNA polymerase 3 in its full enzyme form, hollow enzyme as it's sometimes called, 
in the direction of the opening strands of the DNA. And indeed, as you can see, those strands are pulled apart by an enzyme called helicase. Wonderful name. Helicase gets its name from the helix being acted on by an enzyme, ASE. So helicase then pulls apart the DNA and indeed it's a combination of helicase activities that does its job for us so well. The only complication of the story, of course, is the bottom right hand corner. Have a look in your textbooks as well. But what you can pick out on the story over here is that because we're peeling apart, but DNA strands are anti-parallel, as you saw from the earlier image. It means now the 5 prime to 3 prime works its way down a page and of course up a page on the other strand. In this case, as you can see, 5 prime to 3 prime for the parental DNA on one strand goes this way, on the other strand goes the other way. So if the DNA polymerase has to only move 5 prime to 3 prime with respect to the newly synthesized material, then how is it then we can synthesize this DNA as it all gets pulled apart and make it look like there's a nice smooth flow? Well, the answer is it's made in short bursts called Okazaki fragments after the Okazaki team that first characterized the existence of these short fragments. And again, as I've requested of you all, please have a look in your textbooks. But in this overview story, you can see now that there is a primer uh, which is laid down. It's a short RNA primer, a short stretch of DNA, with, of RNA, um, occasionally DNA-RNA hybrid, which happens to bind to this single strand of material which has been pulled apart. And from that point now, in the opposite direction, there is synthesis by DNA polymerase 3. And as it does so, this extension process now completes the synthesis of DNA over a larger distance. To remove the RNA polymerase uh, components over here, you know, was particularly the RNA primer laid down by this primase, this version of an RNA polymerase. As it's laid down, the short stretches there, it's no longer required now. So the next fragment gets laid down. As extension occurs, there is removal of that primer by a new DNA polymerase which has stepped in as the DNA polymerase 3 has left. The new one as it steps in is DNA polymerase 1. It simply not only extends from the previously laid down fragment into an earlier laid down fragment, but also chews ahead. And it chews ahead using an enzyme contained within a structure called a 5' to 3' exonuclease. And again, wonderful work that's been done describing that as an integral part of the molecule by Doug Rutlag. That then helps to show us, amongst others, um, including Klenow, including, uh, I believe, Seth Lowe as well. And what we've been able to show essentially is that there is this wonderful extension process then that moves through by chewing that then allows complete laydown of high fidelity DNA structure which is sealed using an enzyme DNA ligase. So the story will be clearer to you looking through a textbook system. Finally, of course, we can see, simply for the sake of convenience of drawing, there are some proteins, small dots, associated with still single-stranded DNA as part of this opened up replication fork. And that opened up region now, with those proteins bound, is kept open because those proteins are bound there. They're called single-strand binding proteins, or SSB. Um, and, of course, we also recognize that because this particular structure through its copying process continues all the way through, we can talk about the structure as being a replication fork because it's a fork-like structure. So this fork now, with its, uh, its clear structure defined now, then is the major mechanism by which DNA is copied within our cells. Not surprisingly, of course, we can interfere with that process by interacting with one or more additional players to the story, additional enzymes, for example, which are involved in relaxing some of the twists in DNA. Not surprising, of course, other antibiotics can be considered in terms of how they could damage the function of additional components here as well. So knowledge of the system goes both ways.